Okay, so now let's move on to chapter two. I'm gonna get into algebraic integers and rings of integers. This is gonna be um, where we, the ring theory comes in and we actually start working with ideals and so on. And this is gonna be the main bit that we're gonna study. But we're gonna get these rings from number fields, which is why we've done the whole first chapter. So this is uh, chapter two. It's called algebraic integers. Integers. Uh, this is a this is a subclass from the algebraic numbers. These are some smaller things. Um, our first section is going to be called two point one. It's called rings of integers. Okay. So <clears throat> what's the what's the definition? So it's definition two. I'm going to say two point one point one point one. Um, let k be an extension of q. Q. Uh, I'm gonna, not going to, it's going to have to be finite, so not uh, necessarily finite. Um, an element alpha and k is called an um, algebraic integer. Uh, it's called an algebraic integer. If it's the root of a monic uh, polynomial with integer coefficients. Uh, if it's the root of a monic, this is an important word, um, polynomial with integer coefficients. So compare this to the definition of what I had for algebraic numbers, where I said this is just some complex numbers which satisfy some polynomial um, over the rational numbers. Now, you could have taken it to be monic because you're working over the rational numbers. But in this case, we have a polynomial which has to be monic and all of the other entries have to be integers. So this is the, the key distinction that we have here. Um, these are going to be our, <coughs> our, our algebraic integers. These are things that we're going to be studying. So here's one slightly weird source of algebraic integers, but it'll actually be useful later on. So here's a Small lemma, lemma 2.1.12. Um, if you have a matrix um, with integer coefficients, um, then its eigenvalues are always algebraic integers. algebraic uh, integers. Uh, proof. This is this isn't too hard to prove. You can imagine if you have a matrix with integer coefficients, its characteristic polynomial is going to be have integer coefficients as well. And characteristic polynomials are always monic. So um, uh, that's and eigenvalues are the roots of the characteristic polynomial. So, so there you go. So um, if the matrix is integral, by which I mean it has integer entries, then the char pole has integer entries, integer coefficients, sorry, um, and is monic. So it's so it roots, i.e. the eigenvalues. Are um, algebraic integers. Um, this will come in the fact that we have that a matrix with integer coefficients has uh, eigenvalues which are integer algebraic integers will become useful in like some technical proofs. But if you think back to the standard representations that we were doing, the matrices that were coming out there were always well in the examples that we looked at most of the time all the, all the entries that were coming in there were were integers. So um, all of the, their eigenvalues, all of these things were roots, were most likely algebraic integers. So here's some examples of algebraic integers. Um, examples, so for example, root two, this is a root of x squared minus two, which is some monic polynomial 
monic, so it's a one here, and with integer coefficients, so two. Um, I don't know, something like uh, the, the roots of unity, so uh, z to p for p a prime. So let me, let me write this precisely. So let p be a prime. Then the p roots of unity are algebraic integers. Um, a more easy example, uh, any integer is an algebraic integer. If n is in z, then n is an algebraic integer. Why? Well, it just satisfies as x minus n, right? Here's a, a monic polynomial with integer entries which it satisfies. Uh, some non-examples. Some things that aren't algebraic integers, something like pi, e again. Um, well, these aren't even algebraic numbers, we saw this, but these aren't algebraic integers. Um, if you looked at the solutions to something like, oh, well, like the number one half, the number one half isn't an algebraic integer because this, the number one half does not satisfy a polynomial with a monic polynomial with integer coefficients. Yeah. The, 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 if you think of it, it's min pole is 2x minus 1. Um, and it, this isn't monic. So it does have, it does have integer uh, coefficients, but it's not monic. So this, this can't be an algebraic integer. So the only irrational numbers which are algebraic integers are in fact just the integers. Um, so let me just give you some notation. So um, let k be an extension of q. Uh, so we denote the, at the moment, this is going to be a ring, but let's just, we haven't proven that yet, so let's just talk about it as a set. The set of um, algebraic integers Um, in k by, we denote it by ok, so this is a curly O, a subscript k. Um, this is a, this is the notation for, well, it's going to be the ring of integers. These are going to be the, the objects that we're going to say. These are going to be the rings that are going to be playing a key role in all our course. Uh, let's say we will see this as a ring. See later that this is a ring. But we don't need to see that yet. We can along with further. Um, let me do a little bit other notation. Um, I'm going to let so q bar denote the uh, set of all algebraic numbers. So recall that we um, said an algebraic number is just some complex number which satisfies um, some polynomial with rational coefficients. So um, you can just consider all of the all every complex number which satisfies a uh, a rational which satisfies some rational polynomial, which is a root of some rational polynomial. This you can put it all, all together. This gives you a field. Uh, if you want to think about it, check it, you know see check if this is a number field or not. Um, but we have this as a set of all algebraic numbers. Well, I mean, I said the field of all algebraic numbers, and then inside uh, this. We have, now I'm going to write it out by z bar, um, it's going to be the ring, although we don't know it's a ring yet, uh, of all algebraic integers. So these are all the complex numbers which satisfy, which are the root of some monic polynomial with integer coefficients. Um, I'll just give you one fact about this, which you can use. Uh, note that um, OK, the ring of integers is OK. This is just K intersect Z hat. So if you want to find, if you, if you knew what all of the algebraic integers were, then you can figure out which of the ones are in K. It's just, well, by definition, it's just this, right? I, my definition of OK was, was all the algebraic integers in K. I just denote it by OK. So if, if Z bar is all of the algebraic integers that can exist, then OK is just, well, just intersect it with Z bar and you get your OK.
So, um, it's hard to prove, as, as with algebraic numbers, it's hard to prove that something isn't an algebraic integer, uh, since it's hard to prove that something doesn't satisfy some polynomial. Um, but we can somehow give some results to somehow help us along. So here's a proposition which somehow helps us identify um, the algebraic integers inside of the algebraic number. So here's proposition 2.1.8. So let alpha and k be an algebraic number. Um, with minimal binomial, as usual, that's m alpha. Then alpha is an algebraic integer. Uh, this is pretty obvious. Uh, if and only if m alpha has integer coefficients. Recall that uh, the monic part of my of my condition to be an algebraic integer is automatically satisfied because minimal polynomials, by definition, were always monic. Um, so, if m alpha has integer coefficients, then then it's already monic. So then we're going to be done. So this is this is really uh, easy. So just some, it's almost nothing to, to prove here. Um, so if alpha is an algebraic integer, uh, then it's an algebraic number. Um, so we claim that M alpha has integer coefficients. So remember, for, for it to be an algebraic integer, I just said there exists some monic polynomial which has it as a root. Um, what I'm asserting now is that that it's not just some random polynomial that has integer coefficients. In fact, the minimal polynomial has to have integer coefficients. Um, so m alpha has integer coefficients, this is what we, what we claim. So, as I said, we, we know alpha satisfies, or when I say satisfies, I mean is the root of um, some uh, polynomial. Um, f of x in zx. Uh, I'm going to write monic in brackets. Um, therefore, by our properties of the minimal polynomial, we know that m alpha has to divide f of x because the minimal polynomial always has to divide. Uh, it's the smallest thing which has alpha as a root. So now, here's something that we haven't seen in a while. Uh, now, use the monic Gauss lemma uh, which had number 1.211 uh, to get that m alpha has to be in zx. So if you have some polynomial dividing a, a polynomial which has integer coefficients, then your original polynomial had to be integer. and the monic bit, which is that both of them were monic to start with. So this is a the, the forward direction for the for the back one, for the reverse one. Oh, I should have So this direction, um, if m alpha has integer coefficients, um, then clearly alpha satisfies a monic polynomial with integer coefs, therefore it's an algebraic integer by definition. Okay, great, that's the end of the proof. Um, so among the algebraic numbers we can somehow find the algebraic integers by just uh, checking the minimal polynomials. So we don't have to just find a random binomial, we just check, check its minimal binomial and we'll be done. Um, so this is something about how the, mon minimal, mon how the minimal polynomial tells you about the whether something is algebraic integer or not. Can this field polynomial tell you something similar? And the answer is yes. So here's corollary 2.1.9. Uh, K be a number field.
and take alpha some element named k then um, alpha is an algebraic integer um, if and only if c alpha has integer coefficients Remember, C alpha was the um, the characteristic polynomial of the standard representation. Um, this is a characteristic polynomial, so it's always monic. So I just gotta check. Uh, uh, this, this is somehow a, a, weak, a, a nice weakening condition. And this is nice because um, maybe finding the minimal polynomial might be tough sometimes. But if you, if you can at least find the, the, the characteristic this standard representation, then then you're done. Um, so, but this is this is immediate from what we have. So this follows from um, corollary 1.6.8, which remember linked the minimal polynomial in the in the field polynomial and proposition the previous proposition 2.1.8. Great. Uh, here's another uh, corollary of this. 2.1.10. It's a corollary of the corollary, I guess. So let k in number field uh, and alpha and okay uh, then you can always find an integer so then there exists an n in z take away zero so a non-zero integer such that n alpha uh, is an algebraic integer so pretty soon I'm going to start using my notation. So IE and alpha is contained in OK. All right, this is my notation for the set of algebraic integers in K. Um, so I'll just try to spell it out for as long as possible. So proof. Um, let's consider the standard representation of alpha. So, so let A alpha be the standard representation. of alpha then uh, off the bat this is a, a matrix um, with uh, rational entries remember we uh, to compute the center representation we pick the basis for k over q and so that matrix a priori has entries over q um, you might be lucky then that, we, that in the case that you started off with and it actually has a, matrix, a basis with entries over over the integers but this might not be the case so this is a matrix with rational entries but now just clear the denominators in the matrix multiply by some integer you know some diagonal matrix to clear the denominators um so and then now you end up with a matrix with integer coefficients so now i clear the denominators by multiplying By some matrix, something like that looks like this, some diagonal matrix like this. Just multiply every entry by n, for example. Um, then uh, n, or this this time this matrix. This is the matrix of A of n alpha by our, our properties of of how the standard representation changes. Um, so we have. The product of these two matrices is the matrix for A and alpha. But now this is, by, by construction, this matrix that I've constructed has integer entries because I've just cleared all the denominators. So therefore, um, A and alpha has integer entries. And so by the first lemma that we uh, wrote down, uh, a matrix with integer coefficients, then the second value is algebraic integers. Um, this is a matrix of integer entries. So eigenvalues, which in this case is contain one of them is n alpha, is an algebraic integer. Therefore, it has algebraic integers. Um, so n alpha, uh, which is, I'll just write down, which is one of its eigenvalues, um, is an algebraic uh, integer. Uh, by, what was it, lemma 
2.1.2. Great. So if I give you any algebraic right number, you can always multiply through by multiply it by some integer to make it an algebraic integer. Just think of the if the minimal polynomial wasn't um, if you had the middle polynomial and it had a rational entry or something, then you can always scale it appropriately to to make things um, to make it work. Okay, cool. So now, even before we've checked that this uh, that this okay that this that this is actually a ring of the algebraic integers form a ring, uh, we can actually find out what the algebraic integers are in um, in a quadratic field. And so a field of the degree two. So here's a here's a theorem. So this is two point one point eleven. So I call this as a name integers. Quadratic fields. Maybe I should call this algebraic integers. Algebraic integers in quadratic fields. So <clears throat> now let D be a square free. Um, integer. Ooh. Ooh, oh, no, we're going back to the start. So it be a square free uh, integer. Um, and that k be uh, q square root of d. Then here's the result. Okay, so I'm going to, as, as a set, this is what it looks like. Um, as I said, it looks like the following. So Z, oh, I'll tell you what this notation means. Uh, Z adjoin the square root of D or Z adjoin one plus the square root of D over two. Um, and this is if D is congruent to two or three uh, modulo four. And this is if D is congruent to one modulo four. So here are the two, um, the two uh, possibilities. Uh, let me just do notation. So, for example, z square root d. This is just set of elements a plus b root d such that a and b are, are integer. Um, similarly for the for this. So uh, maybe this one's maybe the other one's a bit more confusing. So I think I should do both of them. Z of one plus root d over two. This is a set of a plus, you can just write it like this if you want. Things that look like this with A and B uh, integers. So this, we're only talking about how they look like as sets. Um, we'll talk about the ring structure on these things later. Um, but as sets, this is what the algebraic integers look like um, inside quadratic fields. The quadratic field is because it's a degree two extension. I'm not sure if I use this term yet or not. Um, okay, so let's prove this. So I'm gonna let out. Let's pick some random number. So like alpha equals a plus b root d, uh, with a and b some rational number. So this is some element of of k. Um, if I have b equal to zero, then we are just asking asking which rational numbers. So if b is zero, then I'm just left with a rational number. I'm asking which rational numbers are algebraic integers. The answer is just the integers, um, which algebraic numbers are um, algebraic, no, no, not which other, which rational numbers are algebraic integers. Um, uh, the answer is uh, is only the integers. Integers. So if if b equals zero, then a has to be some integer. So that's fine. And in both of these sets, I have my a and b. The a was always an integer. So so that's one part of the thing uh, proven. So assume that b is different from zero. Then uh, the minimal polynomial of alpha. Then mm, the min pole of alpha, 
m alpha of x. What does this look like? Well, if you think about this a little bit, you'll find out this is x squared minus 2ax plus a squared minus d b squared. You can check that if your element looks like a plus b root d, the minimal polynomial has to be of this form. This is me an f1 exercise to do. Um, so at the moment, we were assuming that, that this is just some algebraic number. So all we know is that this has, um, we don't know anything about this minimal polynomial. Um, this is what the minimal polynomial, oh, sorry, this is the minimal polynomial of this. Let me say over, over Q, just to be precise, because we're working over the rational numbers. Now, if we want alpha to be in OK, so if we want it to be an algebraic integer, we need so we need the coefficients to be integers. So we need 2a and a squared minus d b squared to be integers. And what I'm going to argue is, I'm going to argue that once you have these two things being integers, then uh, depending on what d is, um, a and b are going to have to be integers or not. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what this what the possibilities for a and b are uh, given that these two things are have to be integers and the possibilities that are possible are going to come down to whether d is 2 or 3 mod 4 or 1 mod 4. So we need these two things to be integers because it's by definition it's an algebraic integer if its minimal polynomial is monic i.e. Yeah, it's fine uh, and its entries are integers. Its coefficients, sorry, coefficients are integers. Um, now since uh, 2a is in z, um, this implies 2a squared divided 2a squared is in z as well. Uh, therefore, if you take 4a, if you multiply this this number by 4 and you subtract this thing, then you know. You know okay. Therefore, since let me try this out. Since a squared minus db squared is in z and 4a squared is in z, this implies that we need to have d times 2b squared is in z. All right, I've just taken, take this number, multiply it by 4. This stays a, an integer. Subtract off this one, and then you end up with this. So this has to be an integer. Um, if 2b was not an integer. So if you're in a situation where this number wasn't an integer, um, then it would have, because it's a square number, it would have a, say, 1 over p squared, or it would have a p squared in the denominator. For, uh, well, not it. Uh, if 2b was not an integer, then d, uh, then 2b squared would have a p squared in the denominator for some a prime p. Some prime p. So I'm saying if this isn't an integer, um, then it's you know, it's going to be you know, like a over b or something. Like, well, it's going to be some rational number. So it's going to have some denominator. So when I square it, the, the, the denominator is going to have some number squared in it. And so there's going to be some prime squared showing up in the denominator. Um, but then uh, this would force would force d to have a factor of p squared in its factorization. Right? Because I have uh, this number is meant to be an integer. So if this had some denominator, so that you'd have like a, say, a p squared showing up at the bottom when you write this out, then d is going to have to have that p, p squared showing up in its factorization. But d is assumed to be square free. So it, none of its factors are squares. So no, no prime shows up more than once. And um, we'll have a p squared in the factorization contradicting the fact that it is square free. Um, so, 
uh, 2b has to be a, an integer. So now we're at the situation where we know that 2a and 2b both have to be integers. So now we know 2a and 2b are in z. So let, that's a lot of so's. Um, the let u be 2a and v be uh, 2b. Then if I look at this, this thing here and plug in my, what I have for u and v, we see that, what do we have? We have u squared minus dv squared is congruent to zero um, mod four. Just think of the, the relationships that, that u and v have to, um, have to satisfy. So if I plug in, you know, if I multiply this by four, then, then this turns into this thing. And because it's an integer, the thing that you end up with is going to be zero mod four, because I multiply it by four. So you have this relation. Uh, now, if um, <clears throat> v is even, then so is is u. So if, if this number was even, so if, if v was even, then 4 v squared would be 0 mod 4. So u squared would have to be 0 mod 4. So u would have to be 0 mod 2. Um, so u would have to be even. Then so is uh, u, in which case, case we have a and b uh, in z because yeah this is an integer this is an integer and it's an even integer so um, if u and v are even then a and b have to be integers great so this is the the, the first case um, so now assume that that uh, v is odd um, I'm going to show that this can only happen if d is 1 mod 4 then uh, we will show that this can only happen uh, if d is congruent to 1 mod 4. So uh, v is odd. Uh, since v is odd, we have um, we have v squared is congruent to 1 mod 4, and uh, u squared is either 0 or 1 mod 4, right? The squares mod 4 are either 0 or 1. Um, but note that um, okay, so it's either 0 or 1 mod 4, but note that uh, u squared can't be at 0 mod 4, as this would mean. So if you look at, uh, if you look at this, this equality that, that we have, that, that we have here, um, if u squared was 0 mod 4, and v is v squared was 1 mod 4, then this means that d would have to be 0 mod 4, but then that would mean that d is divisible by 4. Um, but d is meant to be square free, so this can't happen. So uh, this would mean d would be 0 mod 4, uh, contradicting, again, dictating, uh, d being square free. Um, so therefore, uh, we have u squared is congruent to 1 mod 4, and therefore uh, d has to be congruent to 1 mod 4. Again, uh, I've just said v squared is 1 mod 4, so this is a 1. u squared has to be 1 mod 4, so this is a 1. So this is this turns into 1 minus d is congruent to 0 mod 4. Um, so d is 1 mod 4. Great. And this is the case when a and b uh, where where these things were, were half integers. So this is an odd number and this is an odd number. 
Um, and so this completes the proof. So now, as sets, we know what all of these uh, algebraic numbers and algebraic integers look like. Okay, so this will do it for for part one of this algebraic integers, and we'll continue to study. And we're gonna ne ne the next thing we'll do is actually prove that the ring of algebraic integers is a ring. Um,